All right, everyone, welcome back to the powerhouse. And I am thrilled today to have a very special guest. This is Ashley Brundage. Hey, Ashley. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Man, our listeners are in for such an incredible treat today. And before we do, though, I want to tell everyone how incredible you are. So Ashley is the founder and president of Empowering Differences. And while seeking employment at a major financial institution, and she has overcame harassment, discrimination, and homelessness to empower her differences not just her status as a transgender woman, but also missing the chance to go to college growing up due to the transition. Gender, education, ability, and religion played the key parts in her journey to empowerment. And starting her second career as a part-time teller, she rose to a national VP of diversity and inclusion in only five years, everyone. She has catapulted this four-step process of using empowerment to cultivate change in her new book and online leadership course, both called Empowering Differences. And when Ashley isn't conquering the world, she is volunteering everywhere you can think of. She's serving on so many boards and committees. She's guesting across national news outlets. And she was even named one of the top 40 under 40 in the LGBTQ community nationally by Business Equality Magazine. Oh, Ashley, that is a mouthful, but I know that I've left something out. So let our listeners know how else you're making impact. Um, well, I mean, I'm also a mom and I have <laughs> two amazing teenage boys now who really were my source of inspiration and empowerment initially into surviving through some of the things I had to survive. Um, but having their commitment towards me and, and love and compassion and support has just enabled me to keep fighting longer and stronger and harder. And so you're sleeping like two hours a night, Max. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's like burn the midnight oil and then get up for something really, you know, amazingly important in the morning. So you just make it all work. Oh, well, I mean, you are just such an inspiration to so many people. And actually, I know that, you know, we've been in conversation. And as you know, at Power, we help executive women reach the top, claim their power and take control of their lives. And one strategy we use in our coaching programs is shifting that mindset from victim to disruptor. And with all the adversity that you faced in your life, it's no surprise that one of your keynotes is empowering differences. And it's a book and it's so many things. Can you tell the listeners today how you were able to find power with what makes you different and how some of the others can do the same? Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, it, it kind of came into why I needed to do this research. And um, I went on the computer one one night and I was like stealing someone's Wi-Fi because <laughs> I couldn't even afford the Internet. And I was squatting in a house illegally because we didn't have a place to live. And um, I just remember coming home that night feeling really deflated because of how I was treated trying to find employment as an out transgender woman in Florida in 2010. And I Googled and I went on Google and I said, how to overcome obstacles. And I found this article that said that I needed more empowerment. And then I was like, well, wait a minute, let's talk about empowerment. So I Googled empowerment next. <laughs> and of course, that's when I realized that it was authority and power connected to people so then I was like, okay, well, I know what people is because I was a people manager for 12 years working in the restaurant business. And that's what led me to lead groups of people and recruit and train and develop uh, individuals through their career development. But authority and power, all these constructs that I was not really totally familiar with. And that's when I realized that authority was all of the humanistic elements that lead us to this confidence, right? To lead us to having to claim our power. Um, it's all of the things that we need to kind of push things out of our own way that are maybe bringing us down. Mm -hmm. And and so, and then I was like, well, okay, well, what about power? <laughs> and then I realized that the power portion of empowerment was everything that related to some sort of unit of measure or metric. And it was how many people exist with one of your differences. And if I decided to show up to this job interview and talk about one of my differences, 
if I only talked about it as one of my differences as one person, now I'm not coming with as much empowerment as I could be if I was repositioning to talk about that maybe I'm just one of 2 million transgender people who live in this country, right? Or I might talk about the $1.7 trillion buying power of the LGBT business community, which is the 10th largest economy in the world. And now all of a sudden, now I'm reframing my difference to bring some sort of actual measurable, tangible value not just in the money portion of this, but also in my own confidence portion of this. And that's how to actually empower your differences. And you can apply that construct of knowing how many people have that difference. And then what is the economic impact towards any difference that you're talking about needing to drive empowerment through? Oh, Ashley, I love that. And it's all about that mindset shift. So you know, as well as I, we run across so many people that ask the question, well, why should I have to do that at all? Why should I have to make that argument? Shouldn't people just accept? Shouldn't people just know? What would you say to that? I mean, I can tell you, literally, I had a door slammed in my face from somebody who didn't even want to listen to the number. Um, I uh, I had the cops called on me. I got trespassed from a job interview. Like those were real situations. So yeah, you're going to encounter people who think that, that that's not important, but this is why you have to come with things that get to the heart of the matter so that that way you reach people on a level, right? Like, why was the first thing that I mentioned about being a mom and having kids, right? It was literally to let you know that I can be just like any other amazing, powerful person or businesswoman, right? But then also I talked about the $1.7 trillion because you can't argue with that statistic either. So that's why they have to, if you come with both those items, now you're, you're having the increased likelihood that you're going to reach everybody. Yeah, it sounds like you're hitting them in the head, the heart, and the gut. Exactly. Nice. Oh, I love that. I love that. So, you know, actually, a little bit more on that, you know, given your journey, and you are so open and transparent about your journey, which I think speaks volumes and what you're trying to do in this world with empowering differences and really everyone that you touch. And you have a very unique experience where you got to experience the corporate world identifying as both genders. Mm -hmm. so you got to see into something that most of us do not, you know, with it, this silver lining. Yeah. What do you think the pros and cons to both work? Because I'm fascinated by that experience. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a glass ceiling. It exists. Um, and I've peeked at it on the other side. Um, and it's uh, the biggest thing I'll tell you is that um, just the sheer amount of risk, instant credibility and respect that comes from walking in the room um, with male privilege. Um, it's like bone crushingly different. Um, I had to learn a whole new way of communicating what I wanted to say in a business meeting. Um, because I remember the first few years at PNC Bank where I worked, um, I was seen as abrasive and, um, and I was seen as um, loud and I was seen as militant and I was seen as all these other things. And I'm like, those were qualities that were like, I was thanked for about being vocal and being present and having executive presence and, and privilege and privilege was like very important in in the construct before transitioning and and it was just really interesting and, and even the job that I got like the job that I got working in the I mean I was working in the restaurant industry but like I was I was 20 and I was given my own store at 20 okay <laughs> like no college, no, no. I mean, there were people that had gone to college and they wouldn't have gotten the job as a general manager at 20. Um, and then like, they were like picking, okay, oh, you know, oh, we want you to go to Vegas. We want you to go to McDonald's University. Cause so the company that I worked for was Boston Market Corporation. And for three years, 
uh, McDonald's Corporation owned Boston Market at the time, and 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 so it was. Uh, oh, here's a leadership to like literally they're like handing leadership development opportunities out like candy, and and then I was like, oh, you know, I, I just assumed that that's how it worked. Like I didn't even think that there was any difference. Now, granted, I worked in a different industry, and I had. I almost say that I actually had like four lives. So I had the first one with working in the restaurant industry. The second one was literally being homeless and what that was like, because that was a whole other trying to navigate the world. But then job three or life three was working in the corporate sector um, in finance, which even more conservative than, than the restaurant industry, but it was just a whole different type of, everything was like a different type of, meeting different type of structure um, and it's those society driven structures that i think are like really hard people want to really blow that up especially a common along the gender continuum um yeah i don't know i could keep going on this but i want to get, hear what you think about my experience <laughs> no i think it's so telling because you know obviously i wouldn't know what that's like because i hadn't walked a mile in your shoes it's everything that you know, those I identify as male have told me, right, that that's what it's like and what I'm looking on the outside in. But for you to, to say, yeah, it was very much like they were just handing it out like candy. I wasn't even asking for it. It was yeah. being like served up to me. Just yeah, like I never for a million years thought that I would have a career in the restaurant industry. And it was just like, here you go. <laughs> like, it was like, <laughs> literally, here you go. And then uh, in the flip side, Yes, I went from being a part-time bank teller to becoming the national vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion, but that was not handed to me. And that was not because I was trans. It was not because of any of those things. It's because I had to put forth an incredible amount of business plans and preparation and execution and business results. I was literally generating $3 million in new business revenue every single year for three straight years. And I was tying it all to the diversity work that I was doing in the community. And I was keeping a tabulated spreadsheet on everything. Yeah. And then I walked into that meeting with all of that information, told the hard driven story, showed the data behind it and said, this is why I need to have this job. Now, granted, I, at that point, made it so many other people's idea <laughs> that I had about 40 other people who were advocates and mentors and sponsors who had all been saying the same thing. We need Ashley in this position. We need Ashley to do this. We need Ashley to have this kind of responsibility. Literally, it was all these other people that I had to position to be able to get that. Now, the only reason I knew that was because I saw the other side. Yeah. And I had to make it somebody else's idea who had that power and that privilege to walk in that setting. Oh, I, I love that you brought that up because so many women that I work with, and I know that women that you've worked with and beside for years really have trouble wrapping their minds around that and being okay with mm. that, that reality that you knew. And I found out early in my career too. It's like, is this still this patriarchal white man's world? Yes, it is. But here are some, so many ways that we can continue to gain power. So it doesn't have to be forever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you have, but going back to what I was saying, right. It's capturing the data. It's capturing the moment, but also do mix that with you and your authenticity. Because if you start hiding it, then your confidence is going to go down to the to the basement. You're not going to have, you're not going to have the confidence to want to fight against these fights because it's not easy. No. And, and and I love that you clarify it's not about morphing into them. It's about getting enough of them on your side, but still bringing some awareness into what I think just like you know you said you weren't even aware at that time in the restaurant industry that these things weren't just handed out to everyone right? yeah oh I just I mean I wasn't being malicious in any yeah, not I just at all. thought that 
that anyone, right? And then of course, you know, when I would go to the manager meeting, I looked around the room and I'm doing one of these, you know, <laughs> around the room and I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, there's a couple of women and there's a couple of people who are minor, other types of minoral classification groups. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of white cis head straight guys. So, okay, <laughs> wow, okay, this is interesting. And boy, I don't think I'll ever be able to survive if they ever found out that I was hiding, <laughs> <laughs> hiding my authenticity. Oh, oh, I love it. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, Ashley, we talk about success a lot, you know, with power. And, and I think many of us of when it's female executives and those that identify as female, what do you feel are the biggest obstacles that we're all facing and what strategies? Obviously, we've already dug into those, but what else could you offer to make that path a little bit easier? Um, I, I mean, I think that uh, we, we have to dive a little deeper into making it someone else's idea. <laughs> I mean, because that is like, it's so like, I don't know, it seems so bad, but it's just, you know, it goes back to this whole thing. It's like, literally whispering something to someone and but this doesn't just happen for for females either right this happens for other minority groups um about any topic any difference that you need to empower right the, this does happen in other groups but also um sometimes you also have to wonder which group is it that is being affected i think that's another thing here in this item um because oftentimes right, i have to wonder okay am I, is this conversation going this way because I'm LGBTQ? Is this going this way because I'm a woman? Is this going this way because I'm trans? Is this going this way because they know I'm Jewish? I, I don't know, right? Is this because they know I didn't go to college, right? Which way is this conversation going? And sometimes you, you have to kind of almost build an empowerment strategy for each of your differences. And that's kind of why my framework is in that, is in that realm. Um, but back to going to make things somebody else's idea, like that is just, it's its almost like kind of like a Jedi mind track, as I like to call it, <laughs> right? You have to like paint the picture as to why. And and then, you know, it's almost like, you know, you're almost doing one of these nudges to someone on, you know, underneath the table. Um, but it's the cooperation, it's planning, it's execution that goes with that. Um, and it's allies. Like, do you think that in the board meeting, like in the actual board meeting, do you think the board members don't communicate and figure out what they're for and what they're against and have a discussion? And if they want to go against something, you don't think that they talk to each other right. and plan, the right? Meeting and pair the up. Meeting. Yeah. Right. I mean, so if you don't think that you shouldn't also be doing that in a team meeting and having allies that you work with, and that you plan and that you execute, okay? This is how to get ahead in the corporate space. Literally, you have to be really smart about who you align yourself with. Can't always just be the white guy, right? You wanna, <laughs> you wanna make it other, like you wanna form alliances with as many people as you can. And then you need to keep track of those alliances and cultivate them as well. This is all part of how you can, really build these kinds of relationships. And eventually, right, you're gonna then have people suggesting that you talk in the meeting more, right? And that's when you've realized that you've started to reach this point in a special sense. There were meetings then, finally, when I realized that I had done so much cultivation with people in the side conversations and the side tangents that then when I didn't say what I was thinking, the meeting would come to a halt at some point and someone would turn and say, I want to know what Ashley's thinking. Oh, which is beautiful, right? Right. And oh. if you don't reach that moment in every single meeting that you have with people on your team, then you have not cultivated enough relationships through empowerment. And actually, I know that you've seen it. I see it daily with my clients is, and I'm guilty of it myself as when I was throughout corporate is we don't take the time to do that as much as we should, because we're not seeing a lot of times as women, I think we're accustomed to seeing things with an immediate ROI of being productive. And we don't see the playing golf like the guys do going to dinner, having the happy hours, like there's not a clear outcome, but there actually isn't a brilliant outcome from networking. Well, and COVID too. Yeah. 
So, I mean, that obviously put a huge halt on these kinds of dialogues and conversations and team building and really ally building. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, if you really want to cultivate that relationship, you have to figure out how to meet them on their turf. Mm -hmm. And I love that you talked about golf because <laughs> uh, I, I had this really interesting cultivating thing with golf because, um, and I don't know if you've ever um, looked at this, but we should definitely uh, talk about uh, go for the greens, which is a whole women's golf uh, thing. Have you ever done that? I'm terrible at golf. I, I okay. try and practice, but yeah. Yeah. So my friend uh, runs that organization. It's absolutely amazing. It's all about women coming together to, you know, to learn and, and grow through golf and, um, and obviously like the advent of top golf is and top golf taking over cities is kind of created a little bit more of a equitable playing field for women to, to, to seize control of those spaces. Cause those are predominantly male dominated places. And I remember going to the sales award trip every year at PNC as a top revenue producer. And the first two times I went, I chose the shopping trip. And then I chose the, the museum, right? I went to the, to the, um, the, the uh, Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta. And, um, and then the third year that I went, I was like, you know, I have to be way more strategic. I need to be empowering all my differences. And I, and I went on the list and I said, okay, I'm gonna look at the activities from the lens of where are all the white cis head <laughs> males at? Yes. And I went down the list and it was Saddlebook Resort <laughs> and golf. <laughs> And I said, oh, they're all going to be playing golf. There's no doubt because Saddleberg Resort golf is like a really nice golf course. And, and, um, and then like they once played an actual tournament there, right? The, and in fact, I, I think the, um, I, I don't remember which one it was, but I feel like that it might have been the, the, mixed, the mixed event they used to do with the LPGA and the PGA. How ironic if that's where it was. I feel like that it may, may have been there one year. And so I show up, right? And I chose the golf. Now, granted, I somewhat know how to play golf because I used my privilege prior and uh, I was on my high school team. So there's that. <laughs> but I hadn't picked up a club in years. So the week before I went to the, the, the golfing range thing and I hit a bunch of balls just to, you know, make sure that I could at least somewhat hold my own. And really, when it comes down to playing in a four-person scramble best ball situation, you only have to hit one golf shot the whole day that's good <laughs> or sink one putt the whole day. So you can literally go and practice, go to a putt-putt <laughs> place and you could then show up and contribute, okay, in that, in that construct. So don't be fearful and thinking you can't do that. And so I did that. And what happened, Right. I was thinking I was going to get paired with like the head of corporate banking or the CEO, right? I had my eyes like way high up thinking about who was going to be on my, in my foursome and have five hours of networking with these people. And I got paired with people who were, you know, in similar, um, similar lane, similar level in the organization, a business banker and a, and a branch manager, and then a, and then a regional manager. And I was like, oh, well, you know what? I committed to be here keep on it. Right. And, um, and it, so at the end result, right. Was that the person who was the business banker that I was in the golf cart with the whole time actually ended up being on the committee that chose the PNC bank performance award, which is literally the employee hall of fame induction. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I came up for no, a nomination it was only it had to be like a couple like three three or two weeks two months later was when the actual meeting was and and I and I and then it was, then it was a few weeks after that that I got the phone call from the CEO of PNC Bank who was congratulating me for winning this award and being inducted in the Employee Hall of Fame all because I went in a predominantly male space and and then I didn't even figure this out that this is what happened the, the, tracing it back to the golf thing until the next year when I got invited to join the selection committee meeting. Man. 
Oh my and goodness. then and then that's when I figured it out. And I called Jay, the business banker, and I said, uh, performance award selection committee. Oh my God, I just figured it out. He said, it took you long enough. <laughs> oh my and, and I said, so what was it like in the room? <laughs> now that I know that you were on the selection committee, because I didn't even realize that he was on the selection committee until, until I served on the selection committee the following year. Oh. Oh my God. I love that you bring up this story because it's so beautiful and it shows so many things. Cause I remember I used to do the exact same thing. Like we choose as women, like on these retreats, like we are alone all the time. It's the, one of the loneliest places as executive women. And so we go on these retreats and we're not thinking or only thinking about how can I relieve and feel better now. And I used to do the same thing. And okay. I remember the first time I chose deep sea fishing growing, you know, doing my career pretty much on the East coast. And it was literally how I landed my first executive position in my early thirties. There you go. Was that fishing trip. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so I asked Jay, I said, what was it like in the room? Yeah. <laughs> and, and when they mentioned my name and he was like, well, I mean, I was getting ready to like, say, if we don't choose Ashley, then I'm quitting the committee. <laughs> But like three other executives had beat him to the punch and had <laughs> said the same thing. So, um, so obviously I had been doing a lot of networking and cultivating of people who had power and privilege. Oh yeah. And in that networking, you know, beyond what it serves for you, that's how building relationships, we finally get to a place where we can educate each other. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget a boss that I had in corporate he was, it was the first time this was, you know, a, a, he was of an European descent and he had, was identified, you know, in where he came from, he could not be himself. Hmm. And so he was here in the U S and I was working with him and I built that relationship up so much. And I'll never forget him telling me, Brittany, the board's coming in. I need you to wear something sexy. And I told him, and I said, you know, at that time, I said, you know how your whole life people treat you differently once they find out something about you, something that you can hide. Mm. And so, and that's not right. And he's like, oh yeah, it's terrible, you know? And I said, but that's exactly what you just did to me for something I can't hide. Yeah. And it was the biggest light bulb moment. And it was because I had put in all that time of building that relationship that I could show him someone that had went through extreme adversity himself, but he didn't understand my adversity or anything wrong with what he said. He was literally trying to help me succeed by telling me to look sexy. Wow. Board. But it's those conversations like that. That's, I mean, for me at the end of the day, that's true power, right? You have yeah. to lift yourself up so you can get there. And it sounds like, I mean, obviously you did just that because what you were able to go on and do from then had huge impact at that organization. Yeah. And that was, and then literally it was like a few months. It was like the next, like it was that week that I think was like my first week working in the diversity inclusion uh, role was nice. when I figured out the selection committee thing. And I, <laughs> I had like egg on my face. <laughs> oh. Well, actually, as we know that we could sit here for hours. This is our biggest every time that we talk, but if we could go back in time as we wrap up, and you could talk to your 25 year old self, what would you tell her today? Oh my gosh, just to pull the bandaid off and just be you. Um, I mean, honestly, it was, um, you know, it's, it was so hard because I wanted to have, I wanted to have kids um, really early on. And so, um, and I waited almost too, almost too long. And um, so I probably would have had kids even faster and then, and then, tried to immediately start living my life authentically. And, um, and I waited until I was 30 to start living my life authentically full-time every day. I had like a in and out transitional period, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that just life is so short and, you know, you can't hide things about it because it'll wear on you. It literally, it's why I got fired from the prior job working in the restaurant industry. I got fired, not because I was trans, I got fired because my productivity went to crap um, because of the fact that I was hiding about who I really was and, and I wasn't going to work truthfully and honestly and, and it affected my work performance. So you, you can't let things like that 
dig at you. You have to be you and own you in every moment of every day. Oh, that's incredible advice. Absolutely. And if we could all in, embody that at such a young age, oh, the, the world would be such a different place. Yeah. 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 Well, Ashley, we have to tell our listeners now that we are together about this really cool event that we're doing. We are getting to go on a big boat ride together in November for this incredible event. I'm so excited. We're finally going to get to meet in 3D and vacation even together. But tell the listeners today a little bit about what we're doing. Yes. So I'm uh, hosting the Voyage of Empowerment presented by Alternative Wealth Partners. Um, this five night voyage, um, at sea is leaving Port Canaveral and we're going to Cozumel, Mexico and the Bahamas. Um, and it's going to be a leadership conference where we're going to be baking out empowerment, empowering actions. We're going to hear from some really bad, you know, what speakers, (laughs) um, like you and several others. Uh, there's going to be some panel sessions. There's going to be interactive activities. There's going to be mindfulness meditation, Um, There's going to be excursion, there's going to be all kinds, there's going to be empowerment karaoke, there's literally going to be, everything is going to have some sort of empowerment lens to it. Um, And for those that, uh, that have the chance to join, I think there's like, maybe two or three cabins left. Um, So, um, so then maybe they might want to get on that. I'm sure they'll be able to see that link in the show notes. Um, but also there's the way to join us virtually, uh, which is uh, unlimited the amount of people can join us virtually on Zoom. Uh, we'll be tapping out from the ship um, to, on Tuesday, Tuesday, uh, Sunday and Tuesday during the, the five nights uh, for all the programming that will happen in the conference room. So we'll have the Zoom room and then it'll all be recorded so people can connect and connect on their own time with us, but we're going to really change the shape of how people view about empowerment and leadership conferences by having rising tides lifting all boats. Oh, I can't wait. So thankful to be a part of this, Ashley, and just so many other incredible people. So yeah. thank you so much. Well, Ashley, before we let everyone go, where can our listeners go to learn more about you? <laughs> um, yeah, so you can go to my website at empoweringdifferences.com. Um, you can also connect with me at Ashley T. Brundage, uh, A-S-H-L-E-Y-T-B-R-U-N-D-A-G-E. Um, and that's on social media. And I'm also, my company is on social media at Empowering Diff because differences is apparently too long. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we, we have those differences uh, and we have to choose to always empower all, all of them. All right, everyone. Well, you can catch all of Ashley's uh, contact information, everything about this incredible event as well in the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And we look forward to talking with you next week. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah.